Amen. Amen. Good morning and greetings in Jesus' precious name. <clears throat> I think it was in uh, the winter, November, December of 2006, that uh, my wife and I discovered that we were going to have a baby. And we were very, very excited. <clears throat> We uh, waited until Christmas time uh, to share with our families that, hey, uh, especially on my side of the family, you're going, Lord willing, you will have your first grandchild in, in, in a few months, in some months. And it was after that Christmas time that um, my, my family, um, I'm talking about uh, my, my brothers and my parents, we decided to make a bit of a family trip. Um, at that time, we were still a small enough family that all of us uh, fit into a single vehicle. And then my brother Lyndon and his wife Lucy, they were serving with Choice Books in Washington, D.C. And, and my brother Randy wanted to attend SMBI. And so we decided kind of spontaneously that we would all hop in the vehicle together after Christmas. And we would bring Lyndon and Lucy back to D.C., and drop off Randy at SMBI. And as we were traveling, we were making many good memories along the way. We were really enjoying um, our trip in many ways. But then when we got to Pennsylvania, we had a bit of a medical emergency. Something about uh, Aggie's pregnancy wasn't right. And we didn't know what, what we were supposed to do. We knew we couldn't just leave it. The, the signs were there that this was, this was serious. And, and so, but we were uh, on this busy road far away from home, um, not, not certain uh, what, what we were supposed to do. Uh, part, of, part of us, egging myself, we were like, well, what do we even tell others? Do we tell our family about what's going on? We don't want to take away from the pleasure of the trip. We were worried um, how, how do we even find a hospital? We, we, we need to go and see a doctor. And it was getting quite late um, this, this evening and <clears throat> into the night. We were still traveling. We had, um, we had uh, determined that we wanted to drive to a certain point that day. And, and we were running late as a family. And, but uh, we just knew that we needed to do something. And uh, as, as we called the ambulance, and, and, uh, or, or I should say we stopped at this place that was on the turnpike and, and, and talked to some people there, and, and they, of course, called 911, and soon uh, the, the police were there, the ambulance was there, and, and they were going to take good, good care of us. And I remember as a, as a young husband just feeling kind of lost, um, a little scared, uh, I felt really vulnerable. What, what do you do in a situation like that? Thankfully, as is evidenced by my healthy, uh, almost 16-year-old, we know that, it had, that that night had a good ending. Um, but after we had spent the, the most of the night in the ER, and, and we were told by the doctors and nurses that uh, were taking care of Aggie that everything would be, uh, would be okay as long as, or they thought it would be okay as long as she would be taking it really easy for the next number of days. Obviously, there was a lot of relief. And I, I can still, it's just interesting how I was, I, was, I was struggling to come up with an example for today's message, and we will get to the title soon enough, but it was just this morning, all of a sudden this story, I hadn't thought about this incident for, for many years, it came to my mind, and I remember as we were leaving the hospital and, and turning back onto the PA turnpike that there was this, this, this feeling of gratitude. Uh, of course, the, the, the Aggie was going to be okay. The, 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 the pregnancy was going to be okay. That, that I was, of course, I'm very thankful for that. But in, in that moment, I was extremely thankful for my family. And, and I remember expressing, <clears throat> I don't know exactly what my words were, but that, that I can't think of a better group of people to be going through something like this 
than with you. And they all had their part to play. My mom was healthy at that time. She was there to comfort and pray like mom always did. My, my uh, brother Lyndon, <clears throat> this was before he had his uh, nursing degree, but he was always quick thinking on his feet. And, and he arranged everything with the insurance. And, and, and everyone played a part in making sure that this would be a, a, the best outcome would be possible. And so in the midst of that storm in our life, I was tremendously grateful and blessed to be with the people I felt the safest with. I didn't fear their judgments. I didn't fear their disappointment that we didn't reach our destination as we had planned. I didn't fear that now that Aggie would have to rest for the next number of days that I would hear about this again and again only if, if this wasn't so. No, I felt safe as a vulnerable, scared, young husband, I felt safe with the people that were there. I have titled today's message, Church, the safest place on earth. Some of the experiences <clears throat> in the last number of months have turned my thoughts more and more towards the church and its role that it has in the lives of Christians. Wherever you go, whether I, I, it's privileged to be at Bible school, I was privileged to go to Mexico and preach, interacting with other people, especially if you're interacting with people, the subject of church comes up frequently. In some instances, it's a pleasant subject. In some instances, it's unpleasant because of someone's expectations that were unmet or they were hurt or something happened. And so then the subject of church becomes unpleasant. We find, we find, or I should say an elementary reading really of Paul's letters in the New Testament remind us again and again of the need for the believer to be part of a church, to be part of a community. Again and again, Paul reiterates and is thankful for how people have helped him along the way, for how people have supported him, how people have traveled with him and stood with him through his many ups and downs as he shared the gospel. We even find, I think it is in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, where he laments the fact that everyone has forsaken him. He was, he was standing before, I think it was Caesar's, except for one or two brothers, the rest had all forsaken him. He was there by himself and he says, I was there by myself and yet I'm still thankful because at least the Lord stood with me. And so I don't want to negate the fact that as believers we have Jesus with us at all times. And I think it was in January where I had the, the sermon on, on, uh, on, on being rooted and grounded in God and in Christ. And that is still true today. But as a, as a believer, as someone that is in love with Christ and that is rooted and grounded in the goodness of God and his word, we still need community. We still need church. We find some very strong language, or I should say expressive language, that is used in the New Testament when it comes to the subject of church. As I mentioned already, Ephesians chapter 3, 14 for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We, we, we find again and again scripture uses the term family, family language when it is talking about the church. Paul is here, he's saying, I'm praying to the Father of Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has now become our Father, and I'm praying for the whole family. As a church, we now carry the family name of God. What an awesome responsibility to live up to a family name, namely God's name, Father God. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, 
we have another verse where it says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to whom? Especially to those who are of the household of faith. Again, verbiage or words that, that uh, are, are used for households, for families. Paul tells Timothy to interact with older men and women as fathers and mothers, and with young people like brothers and sisters in all purity. This we find written in 1 Timothy verses 1 to 2. Again, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters. All throughout scripture, the concept of family relationships is used as the example that a church family should look like. Now, the question is, who all has grown up in a family? And that's a question that everyone has to answer, I did. We've all had family whether it was a good, pleasant family or an unpleasant family, we've all had a mom, we've all had a dad, and in most instances, we've all had siblings. We know that when, it, when we talk about brothers and sisters, when we talk about mom and dad, we understand what that entails. Being part of a family brings more joy, more blessings, and more memories. As a family, you can think back to times that you were spending with your mom and dad, good times. Maybe you spent good times with your brothers and sisters. And just because you had the family, your life is richer today because you have these added blessings of these good memories together, these good experiences. Joy. Family can bring so much joy. It is fun to sit down with your brother, sister, whoever it is, and reminisce. Talk about what this is what we did. Remember when. <coughs> but also, being part of a family has, also does bring more heartache. Have you ever thought about it? We just had an example of, of Lewis and Marilyn and their son, uh, Sam. Sam has been, I, I trust, a huge blessing in their family. Uh, and many precious memories associated with Sam and the Lewis and Marilyn family. But because of his sickness over the last three months, that he was part of the family also brought heartache. Why? Because they loved him. They appreciated him. They would like to see him uh, flourish and grow. And so just his presence in the family as loved as he wants and because he was loved he wasn't and if while he was not feeling well there was heartache uh, I'm guessing there was feelings of man I wish I could could somehow take the pain away what, what is there a quick fix that we can rectify this situation so being part of a family a loving environment can also bring about more heartache. It can also bring about more work. How many of you have cooked for your husband? And now you're cooking for a number of children. It's more work. Your family is creating more work. The laundry pile is much bigger today than maybe what it was 20 years ago. The husband has to work a few more extra hours because the groceries are more, there's more groceries. It's more work. Family, the blessings and the joys, memories, it's all true. But there's more work. More time. It requires more time. It's time spent with family members instead of doing just the things that I enjoy just the things that I would like. We have to, in order to have a good family and enjoy our, uh, our time together, it will require that we sacrifice our time and that we will sacrifice the things that we enjoy doing and do the things with the family that the family wants to do in order to build family relationships. Same in the church. I'm going to suggest to you today 
being part of a church. We need it, but it, and it brings blessings, it brings joy, it brings fellowship, it brings good memories. That's all true, but at the same time, it will sometimes bring heartache because all of a sudden, you weep with the weeping one. You care for someone that you otherwise wouldn't if you weren't part of the church. Or maybe, uh, you know, uh, there's other reasons for heartache as well. It's more work to be part of a church than to not be part of a church. There's things that are required as a member in the church from me that take up my time. Uh, There's work required. There's more time that is needed for me to invest because I'm part, I choose to be part of a church. And so that's the same, whether it's the family or whether it's the church, there's certainly more joy, more blessings, more memories, but at the same time, more heartache, more work. It'll, we'll have to sacrifice time and things that we'd rather do so that we continue in the family and in the church. Even in a good family, and I understand that not everyone's family's experience is pleasant, and that's why I'm going to use the term good family. There are times when family members do not get along, but there is a bond that despite the disagreements, they keep sticking it out. Why? Because they're brothers, they're sisters, they're family I regret that I so often would have mistreated my brothers as we grew up, but if someone else were to start making fun of them or say something negative about them, I would often quickly come to their defense. Why? Because they were my brothers. There were times, you know, as growing up, when as a family we would sit together and we would discuss, in confidence, family matters. Things that pertain to our family, whether difficult things, hard things in individual lives, individual lives within the family circle, things that we were struggling with, going through, maybe with one another, or just in life. We would have these times where we'd sit together and we'd talk and we would pray together. And these were times where you could share, I could share as a son in this family and not be concerned that it would spread all over the community. Because it was a safe place. It was a trustworthy place. These were family matters. There was security. None of us could pick our family members. You and I had no say in who our parents were and who our siblings were. We did not pick them. God says in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 18 to 19, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? So this morning, I challenge us. It's a a little bit of a practical message. It really is topical and practical. I want to challenge us to just take a look around us with this verse in mind and, 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 and realize that God has placed each and every member, the brother, the sister next to you, he's placed them here in this church exactly as he pleases It has pleased him to put the brother that is next to you or in front of you or behind you, same with the sisters, to place that brother, sister right here in this family. We have to to think about the sovereignty of God and how he brought us all together from so many different places on this globe. And God's design For the local church in this morning, for this church, our church, is that we would be bound together through Christ. And together that we would be a safe place for each and every member. 
that it would be a safe place for us to be vulnerable with one another, to share in our pains and our sorrows, to share in our struggles, to share in our joys, and to share in our triumphs. There's a number of things that we find practically written out in the New Testament in regards to what are some of the things uh, that are supposed to be part of a church. And this concept, the, the, the topic of church is so, so wide and so vast. And there's so many different directions that we can go. But tonight, today I want to more focus on, is the church a safe place? Is it a place where we get along, where we are bound together in Christ and we love one another. In, in Titus, we're, in the German messages, we're going through the book of Titus. And in chapter, uh, chapter one, it's a, it's a book that is designated to instructing Titus on how to establish a church in Crete. And in chapter one, Paul writes about uh, the, the Cretan society, and he describes the society in not so nice language. He says that the Cretan society, the culture of the Cretans, is such that they are they described as liars. They're described as evil beasts. My interpretation of that is that they are they are beasts that uh, like compared to evil beasts. In this way that they like to tear one another down. This is, they, they find pleasure and possibly joy in the misfortune of other people and of people in their community. And so Paul tells them, this is the society, Titus, that you're going into. It's, it's a, they're, there's, they're liars, they're evil beasts, and they're lazy gluttons. Not a very pleasant society culture to be living in. Yet in second, the second chapter of Titus, Paul begins in earnest to instruct Titus on what the church should look like. And I'll take the time to just read the first 10 verses of Titus chapter 2. But as for you, he's speaking to Titus, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, Temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young woman to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed." Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a good pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an, opponent, an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bondservants to be obedient to their masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not palfering, pilfering but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God or Savior in good things. Titus is responsible to lead out in sound doctrine. As part of teaching sound doctrine, it becomes very practical here. Paul gives Titus some things that he is to make sure that these things happen in the church. And one thing that is supposed to happen is that there will be mentoring, a concept of mentoring, that the more mature in faith will be helping the less mature. Mentorship is there to help us grow in our own faith and to pass on the things that God has given to us to the next generation. To pass it on, to make sure that it doesn't get lost. We find even in the Old Testament how God made provision 
Uh, you know, the Israelites were supposed to place an oddly stacked rock pile here, or they were supposed to do this or that. Why? So it would cause the children to ask questions about why is this here? It's a form of mentorship, a form of passing on the story of God, the narrative of God. And even more so, mentorship, passing on, sharing with others what God has done in my life, helped me overcome is a way of encouraging someone else in their faith and helping them to reach maturity. I have learned so much, so much from men that were vulnerable enough to open up about something in their life, just shared with me how they overcame that struggle or how they saw. So much of my faith has matured because someone was willing to mentor. Not necessarily ongoing meeting every Tuesday for breakfast, but just in a timely manner, time and place, being willing to share and impart wisdom. Why is this important? Paul gives us the reason here in three times, or I should say in verse five, that the word of God will not be blasphemed. You know, the the, the world is gonna look at the church and they're going to look at the relationships within the church. They're gonna look at the maturity of the church and they're going to make conclusions based on what they see. And the mature, the, the, the faith as it matures, as people grow in their faith, it is evidence of a God that is alive and that the principles of a book that was to, written 2,000 years ago is still working today. And so that the word of God will not be blasphemed, that the opponents of the gospel that we find in verse 8, that the opponents of the gospel or church may be ashamed because they have nothing to say against you, the church. And verse 10, for the adorning of the doctrine of God. It's, just, it's not just theory. This works in real life. The sound doctrine that, that the men are supposed to pass on to the next generation is to be sober. Obviously sober from drunkenness. To become serious, sensible, solemn. To be reverent. To have profound respect and love for the things of God and for people. To be temperate, don't always having, not always having to prove my worth, not always having to prove that I can do something better than something else. This is the sound doctrine that the men, the older men, the mature in the faith are supposed to pass on to the next generation. Temperate means to not burst out in anger when things don't go my way to live within my means, not always outspend my paycheck, to be able to teach the younger men how to control the fleshly lusts that come their way, to be sound in the faith, not to be blown from side to side by every new doctrine that comes our way, to, be, to, to teach, to pass on how to lead out and protect families from things that hinder sound faith, Sometimes this will mean teaching younger men how to stand alone or put things in place that are family specific because of a weakness that I have. How to be loving towards a wife, towards children, towards neighbors, coworkers. How to be patient, to be sound in speech. We all speak a few thousand words per day. Are they Sound speech? Is it sound speech? Could someone blaspheme God and say Christian's speech is not attractive? Same thing, Paul is reminding Titus, make sure that the older women, they also teach sound doctrine. They also pass things down to the younger generation, that they are supposed to be reverent in behavior. Leaders, examples of reverent not slanderers, to only speak things that edify, not saying things about someone that we aren't willing to repeat in their presence. Teachers of good things, Paul lists six good things that are supposed to be passed on to the younger generation. Teach the younger women to love their husbands and children. 
when life gets busy, overwhelming? How do I love my husband? How do I love my children? How to be discreet, to be friendly and outgoing, but not flirty, to be chaste, to be good. When life seems overwhelming, to not lose it, to not break down and start blaming husbands, children, or other people. To have the mental and emotional strength to take a break and go and pray. Teach them how to be homemakers. Teach them to be how to be obedient or submissive to the husband. To be a team player. To come along the husband's vision for the family. And so this is one concept that Paul reiterates to Titus here. In this godless society that you are in, you as a church, and that's not only for, for the church at Crete, it's for us as well. You're going to need men and women that are going to be willing to be open up and to be vulnerable and pass on wisdom, pass on the grace that God has extended to them in order so that the young generation, the next generation can mature in their faith as well. And so that's the concept of membership. As I was thinking about this con- the, 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 the church concept and relationships within the church, my thoughts turn to all the one another phrases that we have in the New Testament. They did a quick search. It seems to me like there's at least 59 times where we have a verse in the New Testament that has something along the lines, one for another, one anothering, some uh, etc., 17 times, they did a little bit of research, 17 times the New Testament commands us to love one another. John 13, 34 to 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all we know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. See, we're moving now not from a mentorship relationship, but just relationships within the community of believers. How we interact with one another. We're commanded at least 17 times to love one another. Romans 12.10 says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor. Do what? Give preference to one another. If you invite someone for lunch that you really like and you suppose you have tomato soup and uh, you are, because this is someone that you really like, you are wearing your best clothes for that day and, and this guest makes stumbles and somehow this tomato soup dumps onto your new clothes. Let's say it's a dress. And they are very apologetic Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, what are we going to do? And because you like the person, you love the person, your response, and genuinely, so it's okay, we'll try and get it out, we'll save this dress, or shirt, whatever it is. It's okay, let's not allow this to ruin our time together, it's so good to have you here. That is if it's a person that you really like, if you love. If it's someone that you and I struggle to like or struggle to love, we get annoyed at the way they hold their spoon as they eat their soup. You know the difference? We've been there. The tiniest little thing can be an annoyance, and that's why God is reminding us again and again as a group of believers, love one another. Make sure you love one another. Eight times it talks about encouraging one another. Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, encouraging one another. How are you today, young man? Oh, I'm blessing the Lord. As this morning when I got up, you know, this hymn got into my mind, and I've been singing it and repeating it. You know what I mean? That sort of testimony has a way of lifting my day if it's difficult for me. Share with one another psalms and hymns and spiritual things. 
First Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, what? Comfort one another with these words. This is not all that's, this is all, not all that's gonna be. There is coming a day where you and I will be redeemed. Comfort one another, encouraging one another. First Thessalonians 5, verse 11. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another. Hebrews 3, 13. Exhort one another, how often? Daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Seven times this one anothering referred to humility and accepting one another. Philippians 2, 2 to 4 says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem, esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Romans fifteen seven. I'm going to skip a lot of these verses. Therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. In humility, accepting one another. Five times it talks about bearing each other's burdens and sharing and showing compassion. I was reminded this morning, Galatians chapter 6, 1 to 2, we, we often, we, we know this, the, the verse to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, in what context that comes, it says, brethren, the verse one, it says, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are a spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. Be willing to get down and dirty in the messiness of someone else's sin and help bear the burden. Four times it talks about kissing one another as we meet a sign of belonging, a good solid handshake, a hug with a warm, how are you brother, how are you sister? It talks about serving, hospitality, harmony and peace, forgiving one another, confessing our faults one to another, to pray for one another. It also six times it has a do not. Do not grumble, do not slander, do not lie, do not envy one another. It asks us to stop passing judgment, to not destroy the church by biting and devouring one another. It is so much easier to label others by their weakness, to label others by their mistakes, or the sins of their past. It's been amazing to me how often I've been part of a conversation with someone and I will mention something good, positive, a good quality about someone else outside of who I'm conversing with. And I will share that. You know, the other day I was blessed by brother so-and-so and this is what he did. And it it, it shocks me sometimes how often a conversation, I will have shared that with someone else and then that re- the response from that will be, that's good. But did you hear what he or she did? Did you hear what they did? Right away, trying to take away the blessing. Have you heard? It might be true. That did you hear might be true. But that, why do we so often feel the need to tell others about that. I believe this is one of the reasons we label others by their weaknesses. This is one of the reasons why we have such a feeling of loneliness in our churches. Feeling like I don't have any friends. Feelings like I don't 
I can't share anything. I don't know who's trustworthy. And I grieve with someone that feels like that. In a big group of believers can feel completely alone. Why are we afraid? That, why do we think we can't share with others? I think one of the reasons is we're afraid that we too will be labeled by our weaknesses. We don't want to be labeled. We'd rather just give the label to someone else. And my prayer today is that we would not sit here and judge one another or the IMF church and all its areas that we feel like it shouldn't prove on. But rather, my earnest prayer is that as a church, or I would say that our church is made up of individual people, and what type of person am I? What kind of church member am I? What am I contributing to the, in this instance, the local church? I'd much rather have us examine ourselves and ask the question, what kind of brother or sister am I? Am I someone that's trustworthy? Am I someone that is safe? Am I one that encourages and lifts up the discouraged one? Or do I find comfort in the fact that someone else's life is more uh, messy than mine? Or I will make sure, and I will make sure to continue to point that out so that the attention will not be diverted to my own messy heart and life. I'd like to just give me a few more minutes, close with a story. And I'd like for us to, as we listen to this story, think about who are we in this story. There's many different characters. And in the life of the church, who are we? In September of 2018, Bothan Gene, a 26-year-old black man, was sitting in his Dallas apartment watching TV and eating ice cream. Amber Geyer, a 30-year-old white police officer, was coming home from work. She was distracted by her phone and parked her car on the fourth floor of her apartment block instead of the third floor where she normally would park her car. And it was also on the third floor that her apartment was at. And she walked towards the apartment building just like she always did not knowing that she was on the third floor instead of the fourth floor. She walked to her apartment number. She opened the door, and to her shock found a man sitting in her living room, or she thought her living room. She pulled out her gun, and she shot this intruder and killed him, only to realize that she was in the wrong she was in the wrong apartment. She had killed a man in his own apartment. Of course, with the current racial tension in America, this caused a huge uproar. Miss Geiger was fired from her job and charged with murder. During the trial, there was a lot of media attentions. Uh, protests and anger were present during the trial. Miss Geiger had allegedly sent some racist texts many years before. And this just amplified an already amplified situation. After the jury found Miss Geiger guilty and sentenced her to prison, Botham Jean's 18-year-old brother was given the opportunity to give his victim impact statement and what he did with this opportunity changed the entire narrative of this very tragic incident. Remember, he's 18 years old. He's a black man who lost his brother to what seemed to be a racially motivated killing. An entire country is up in arms filled with anger. And you see this young man, this 18-year-old brother is a Christian and in a very calm an unscripted speech, he faces Miss Geiger and he tells her, and this talks to her, and this is what he says. Miss Geiger had profusely, profusely apologized and begged for forgiveness to the Jean family. And he responds, he says, if you are truly sorry, I can speak for myself. I forgive. 
And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you too. And I don't think anyone can say it again. I'm speaking for myself, but I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my mother did, or my brother did, but I presently, right now, want what is best for you. And I wasn't really going to say this in front of my family or anyone else, but really, I don't want you to go to jail. I want what is best for you because I know that that's exactly what Botham would want for you as well. And the best would be for you to give your life to Christ. I'm not going to say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that Botham would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person, and I do not wish anything bad for you. This 18-year-old man turned to the judge and asked, I don't know if this is possible, But can I go and give her a hug? Please. The judge doesn't know what to do. So he asks again, please, can I go and give her a hug? The judge gives him permission. And he got out of his witness chair, makes a few steps forward to Miss Geyer, and she ran out to meet him. He embraced her and held her as she wept. According to the reports, everyone was moved. Tears were on everyone's face. A judge, the judge, a black lady as well, was so moved by the young men's actions that in tears she went back to her chamber and got her Bible and came back and spent several minutes witnessing to Miss Geiger in very hushed tones. She pointed Miss Geiger to John 3.16 and other passages, sharing the gospel with her. Miss Geiger was led out of the courtroom, clutching the judge's own personal Bible to her chest. And it changed the narrative, the reporting of that terrible situation for the next day. The actions of this young man were the headline news. I'm convinced today that that sort of act of forgiveness does not develop in a heart that is complaining and critical of others. It only happens in hearts that are bowed before the Lord and are totally aware of the grace that was needed to save me and all my sins and all my weaknesses and are convinced that that is the only grace that needs to be extended to others and their weaknesses and their sins as well. Who are we? Are we the one that can stand up and say, I forgive you in a packed courtroom filled with anger? Are we the angry one? Are we the one that made a grievous mistake? Who are we? In the context of the church, may our church, this local IMF church, be filled with 18-year-old men that extend grace to others. Let's pray. God, I just want to come to you and, and, and just pray that you would help us to be good brothers and sisters in the church. Help us to be a community that lifts up and encourages, cheers on others in their journey of faith. May this be the testimony of each and every one here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.